Tonight's speaker is Michael Polivka, recently of Autodesk, who's going to talk to us and give us our inaugural view into design ops. And I think a lot of you probably are here because you know what that means and you wished there were a term for it a long time ago. So, Michael, I invite you to take it on. We didn't rehearse this thing. I don't know how, how interactive you like to be, but because we like to record the audience as well, give time for somebody to run with the microphone if that happens. Okay, I teed it up to do questions at the end. Perfect. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Good, just there's a lot of slides to go through. Yep. All right, well, good evening, everyone. And thank you for being here. And thank you, Nancy and Smitha, for inviting me to come. So I love connecting dots for a living. And I, that's because I'm a systems thinker. And today I'm going to tell you a story of how I did this at Autodesk with a technique called relationship maps to affect design at scale. But the ground rules, like I said, are pretty simple here. I'll talk for a half an hour and go through this presentation, and then we'll talk together and answer any questions and just see if we can get something going with design ops or creative systems or whatever it might be. So let's kick this off with a quick look at the evolution of modern design as we know it. Anybody ever work with this stuff? Okay, we're Rubulith or Amberlith? This was a razor blades and tape and markers and Pantone chips. And not that long ago, this is how we printed things. And then came the era of desktop publishing. How about Quark Express? There's gonna be a few more. Okay, Quark. all right, there we go. Quark, it's still my favorite software well, company, name of all time. Um, this was an era now when we were using computers to both design and print things. And how about desktop authoring? Any director users out there? Okay, a few as well. This was a big deal for me. Director was the first time that as a designer, I could create interactive experiences on the screen without the help of any developer. It changed everything. Now, the tools that we've looked at have really been focused on craftsmanship and about creating a single thing. But if we look at our tools today, this is a really different portfolio from not that long ago. And while craftsmanship still plays a really important part, this is about communication and collaboration. So our tools have evolved, and they really mirror our new responsibilities. What used to be linear and waterfall is now iterative and agile. Designers used to be in marketing or engineering groups, and today they're found across the entire organization. For the most part, we as designers followed policies, but today we're actually influencing processes and pipelines. And this is a big deal. We used to be focused on individual design, and the future is about design systems and systems design. I think we've hit the jackpot. Like, the design business is going really, really well. Take in these numbers for just a moment and really hold that and consider how many people that is. Now, I'll be the first to admit, this sounds a little bit like science fiction to a lot of people. And we didn't do any sort of hiring like this at Autodesk, which was a source of frustration for me and a lot of other people. Um, we were outnumbered by engineers to a ratio of maybe a dozen to 15 to one. Um, but things are getting better. And if they're not better in your companies today, I'm sure they're going to be soon. So we're now getting what we asked for as designers. There's more designers, there's more responsibilities, we have more tools available, and there's more budget. Yay, <laughs> these are really, really good things to have as designers. And designers are now represented in executive leadership. My boss, Maria Jadis, was uh, the first VP of experience design ever at Autodesk, at a 35-year-old software company. Then you have someone like Catherine Courage. She's now the VP of Ads and Commerce User Experience over at Google. Like, these people in these roles in these companies marks a major shift in the importance of design. And experience and design are now part of corporate brands. They're a market differentiator. But it's not nirvana. And just like hitting the jackpot, change isn't always easy. And with the new uh, success that we have, new demands come along with them. We have more expectations and more accountability now as designers. The move from individual design to design systems isn't easy, 
Some designers don't like it, and other designers just don't get it. And our old ways of operating are not enough to succeed at scale. Which brings us to the birth of design operations. I call it a layer of management for design. Really a, like a translator or a gateway between designers and the rest of the company. On one side, it's about maintaining an insulated space so designers can do really great work the way they need to. But on the other side, it's about bringing design out to the rest of the company and bringing the company into design to start cross-pollinating needs, empathy, and understanding. So key relationships to cultivate can be found in an org chart. And I'd like to share you, uh, with you what I had to work with at Autodesk. Now, this is, I love this image. I could just stare at this all day. Um, it's a still from a video created by the Autodesk research team. And it's a circular org chart. And the dots are groups and people. The lines are reporting structures. The colors indicate the recentness of activity. And this goes all into the CEO. And in the video, this thing just continually moves and shapes and morphs. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it just keeps moving. Now, at the time I did this work, Autodesk was about 8,000 people. And the two product orgs uh, together made up about half of the company. And we, our global practice team for design, was a lean 18. We were focused on community and influence. We were decentralized, which means designers in the product groups did not report to us. But we relied on volunteers from all around the company to bring our vision to life. So this is the structure of the product org, and this is really just for some context here. There were two main groups that were responsible for over 150 products. There is DCP, which is design and creation products, and MCP, which was manufacturing and construction products. We in Experience Design were one of several horizontal practice areas that worked through these groups. And we were focused on influencing the practice of design to make it be as good as it could be. And we had three main areas of focus, vision and leadership, programs, and design operations. And by balancing these things in just the right way, we were able to bring our vision to life. And we worked outward with our initiatives from task forces creating deliverables out to the product teams that would consume them all the way out to the customers. So from the inside of the company, all the way out. So maps help us navigate complexity. And a relationship map is both mindset and a technique based on this. It helps us move beyond the org chart to look at the relationships needed to make things happen. They're a mashup of a stakeholder map and a strategic plan. And they help us understand where we need to go and how we need to get there. And they're particularly useful when you're working alone or you're working with a small team. I call them like these cross-company microcosms. They help identify stakeholders from across the organization that can make your efforts come to life. They bring people together for a greater purpose than their day-to-day -day jobs. And it promotes meaningful change by involving operations teams. To me, it's a contrast of, of management versus leadership. An org chart is about formal reporting. And a relationship map is about networking. It's about hierarchical versus gravitational. It's direct reports versus colleagues. And it's teams and silos versus teams collaborating. And because relationship maps are rooted in leadership, they're a great way of getting things done with people who don't report to you and aren't accountable to you. So just a little pop quiz here for the audience. So what's the most important part of a relationship map? Uh, you would think, right? Yeah, that's a great answer. Well, what relationship of what? People. That's it. This story is all about people. And how we as designers work with other people is going to determine our success going forward. 
Now, tools and processes alone are not enough to do what we need to do at scale. Design is no longer fringe, and we need to integrate with the rest of the company. We cannot make big impact if we're over in the corner with our headphones on. It's just not going to happen. We need to increase our professionalism without losing our sense of play. And this is a really difficult balancing act. But we as designers have some relationship debt to work through. Now, I, I coined that term. I think it's kind of cool. I'm going to give you some examples of what I mean by relationship debt with some quotes that I collected. Like, you can't make this stuff up. Like, this is where we're starting from. Designers don't have the highest opinion of other groups in the company. And I suspect it has something to do with being pulled away from real work that needs to get done. All right, but in turn, other groups may not always have the highest opinions of us either. We come across as high maintenance, most likely we were just not understood. And yeah, I, I need a Mac to do my job. That's how I roll. Or some people are impressed by our strengths, but they're equally perplexed by our weaknesses. Now I'm going to do a little time machine again here, and take, I'd like to go look at Apple's brand, because I think the evolution of Apple's brand is really in line with what we as designers need to do with our brand. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs, and the square holes. This campaign brought Apple back to life in the 90s, and it spoke directly to creatives and designers. But they've been replaced by The Rock, right? the people's champion, Dwayne Johnson. This dude is all about broad likability and broad influence and speaking to everybody, not just to designers. And there's something about this broad influence that we need to start embracing as designers as well. So I'd like to take a look at how broad influence and a relationship map can affect design at scale at a 35-year-old software company. This is a case study for adopting and rolling out Envision at Autodesk. This is not an endorsement. There are a lot of great tools out there. This is just uh, using this as an example because it's really um, specific to, to the relationship map process. So our designers were working in silos around the company. They were disconnected, and they were solving similar problems in different ways. They were also using their own tools and processes. And worse, the, the rest of the company had no visibility into design. It was as if it was behind a curtain, and people couldn't get an understanding of what was, why it was even important. And this ran counter to our goal of creating a cohesive family of products. So my vision was to bring in and institute a design platform that everybody in the company could participate in. So I assembled the Tools and Resources Task Force. This was made up of 15 amazing volunteers from all around the company that I recruited. And they were all involved for their own personal reason of bringing, uh, changing and improving the culture of design in the company. Now, this is the mission statement, and I'm going to read it. The Tools and Resources team is committed to improving the quality of Autodesk's products by supporting radical design collaboration through a common core set of tools and resources that harmonize our prototyping, designing, and production efforts. Now, we're going to come back to those in a little bit to see how we did. Now, this goal of mine was a mountain to climb that an org chart wouldn't work for. I would have to get people who didn't report to me engaged. And I would have to create purposeful relationship maps to get, uh, uh, relationships to get things done. And this is where a relationship map led the way. Now, there are three main steps to working with a relationship map. Number one is pretty obvious. You have to create the map. You have to start connecting the dots. And as design management, design leaders, even designers, as storytellers, like. I think we have a great ability to go out and recruit people. We have like, there's a, a zest in us, like a fire in our belly that I think is really unique. 
But we have to have a vision, and we need to be able to clearly communicate this, and we have to state it with conviction to get people on board. And we need to identify and bring in people who can help manage this thing and really own pieces of it. I'm not talking about someone who wants to give their opinion on Slack. I'm not talking about someone who wants to swing by for a piece of pizza in a meeting. I'm talking about someone who's going to wholly own a piece of this. So let's talk about how I did this at Autodesk. So there's me. And nobody else on the XD practice group worked on this, so it's just by myself. And I have a lot of initiatives going on. This is just one of many things I had going on. So my goal is to work in a manageable space of one to few to many to make impact. Now first there was the XD Tools and Resources Task Force. And there were three teams on this task force. This group was specific to the launch and communications around the launch for Envision. Then there was my boss, Maria, and her boss, Mar, you know, they had the money. And I probably should have made their font way bigger than that in hindsight. And any sort of approval from them was going to involve finance. And Kim was our group's dedicated finance business partner. And with any sort of enterprise deal, there would be procurement. They would need to help make sure that the contract was in order. Now this team started to emerge from the woodwork as things got approved in the finance systems. I never, I didn't know who they were. I never worked with them, but I was going to have to figure it out if I was going to get this done. And no contract would be complete without legal. And like Kim, before in finance, John was our group's dedicated legal business partner. And because I wanted to roll this out with single sign-on, I would need to work with IT. Now, SSO was really important because it would allow for you know, an integration between the InVision login process and the existing credentials that we all had as a company. So that would be, I wanted to remove any barriers from use, and that was really important for me. So I proactively reached out to this team. I didn't know who they were again. Um, they had just recently gone through some big layoffs, so getting their attention was tricky. Uh, I had never rolled out a, an enterprise software package that could support up to 8,000 people. So this is a little bit intimidating, but I would have to, again, figure this out if I was going to make this happen. And lastly, to bring this home, I would need the Envision support team every step of the way. This is another group that I had never worked with. Um, and the handoff between you know, the sales dude who made it sound like it's the best thing in the world and the customer success team who was going to have to really roll it out was unknown. And this just gets bigger. Everybody on this screen had maybe one, two, or three other colleagues they were going to work with in some capacity to help get this done. So I'm looking at an initiative that probably has 50 to 60 people involved now. And this is too much to manage with my bandwidth. I was going to have to find something much more sustainable. And it called for a more personable relationship map. So I focused on organizing the task force. My primary go-to person became Christina, the program manager. Now, she would act as my primary interface between the rest of the team. And then Leslie agreed to be the captain. So I had a nice flow between designers into Leslie, to Christina, and into me. And this also let Christina, the program manager, own the other two teams and efforts that were going on with this task force that were related to Slack and, and Sketch. Of course, my boss was a major part of this. Um, what Maria did for me was help me understand the way Omar needed to digest and approve information. So this had, you know, I, I've created a lot of slides and a lot of spreadsheets and things like cost-benefit analysis for him. Now, Kim was a trusted finance business partner. I had worked with her a lot in running our group's PNL, and I was looking forward to working with her again. With procurement, I needed someone to act as the point, and Joe being the most senior person, I naturally chose him. Now, I did work with other people on his team from time to time directly, but as the leader, the accountability rested on him. Now, I had a great relationship with John. Uh, I have photos in Vegas to prove it. 
but I had never actually worked with him on a legal deal before. So this is really fun. I was actually looking forward to this. And then Shell was my point person out of the gate with IT. Uh, so I held on to that because of all the things going on really tightly. Prakash was her boss who I worked with a little bit from time to time directly. But um, there was the, SS, the core SSO implementation team with Rajiv and Harold. So they went into Emily, to Shell, and into me. And much like the structure of the task force, this made a nice flow from the developers up through that team into me. Now, Lauren was our lead customer success manager. And naturally, again, she's my lead point of contact. But Envision provided a really robust email ticketing system. And this is just a sample list of all the people that were involved. Um, there was too, a lot of noise, a lot of little details, a lot of things going on. When I needed to cut through it to cl and get more clarity or something was uh, not clear, I would just get up the phone and, and call her. So she was my point. And just like that, this is a much more manageable relationship map. This is, a, this is what, a core relationship map of one to seven. And this is a place I can lead from now. And this method also allows for the creation of submaps. So Christina, the program manager in the task force, built a much more tactical relationship map based on her needs. So that's how you build a map. That's step one. Step two is to start establishing common grounds. You know, everybody in the company you work with has more important things to do. And they have more important people to do things for. So the question is going to be, how are you going to get them to want to work with you? I think you need to identify areas of mutual benefit with each team member. You need to ensure a balanced system of give and take, especially if someone's a volunteer, because I had to work with that. If someone's giving me 10% of their time, how are you going to give it back? Like, and you really need to have an answer for that. And then agreeing on the definition of success. Like, I'm sure everybody in this room has been on a project that maybe halfway through things went off the rails because it wasn't really well defined. You can't do that with these people. They're already giving a little bit more than they should. So I focused on meeting people where they were. I made sure that my asks aligned with their interests. I got to know people so I could tap into some of their intrinsic motivators, both personally and professionally. I built my brand and legacy as a takeaway with each relationship and each person. I wanted them to say good things about working with me to their colleagues. I wanted to be able to go around the company and have that reputation help me get more things done. And for those who know me, this is incredibly important. Uh, when I'm in alignment with my values, I am engaged in work, I'm fired up, and I'm highly productive. And when I'm not in alignment with my values, just forget about it. Like, you know, flat, disengaged, and don't even want to be there. With Christina, the program manager, my value was coaching. With Maria, my boss, it was purpose. With Kim in finance, it was respect. With Joe, in procurement, it was balance. With John, the lawyer, it was fun. With Shell in IT, it was about achievement. And with Lauren at Envision, it was change. Now, step three is to express gratitude. I'll say that Design management is a thankless business. And it's not glamorous work. And every single inch is earned. But we still need to let others be the heroes by placing them in the spotlight. If they're delivering on something that we're wholly accountable for, we need to give them that recognition. And strong appreciation is key to everybody that helped. You know, it's important to make sure that credit is given and that people know about it. I practiced what I'll call a broad spectrum approach. It's some combination with different people in the, in the bullets that I'm going to share here. Um, acknowledging them publicly, you know, sharing congratulations or thank yous or just statuses and emails, wikis, LinkedIn, um, the XD Awards. So a couple months after Envision launched, this task force won the runner-up 
for the runner-up at our global annual design conference. And the peer recognition was incredible for their effort, you know, getting them almost on stage and all the conversations that came about it. So it's just nice to get them into that space. I awarded points in a system that company had called Applause, which let employees buy things like iPads or headphones. And I acknowledged managers where I could. I also took people out to lunch, dinner, and drinks. Like, we're human beings, and this is a social business. So all of this is about affecting design at scale. And let's see how I did. So we're going back to these three points, right? Radical design collaboration, common core set of tools and resources, and prototyping, designing, and production. So Envision successfully launched at Autodesk in April of 2017. Single sign-on was enabled for all employees, and it was so easy. All anyone had to do was go to autodesk.envisionapp.com in the network. Their account was automatically created, and they were automatically logged in. There was no barrier to entry whatsoever. As of November 2017, there were 1,900 employees subscribed across 36 countries. We had 1,800 projects, 40,000 screens, and we're moving at a clip at that point of 25 new projects being created every week. Like, designers at Autodesk were now working together in an unprecedented way. And a bigger deal is 1,900 employees. There are only 400 or so designers in the entire company, in product and in marketing. So we now had 1,500 people that were either executives, PMs, engineers, whatever, that are now in a design tool for the first time in the company. And that was the beginning. The next steps were really focused on fostering adoption. It was about increasing usage. It was if people are using it, we wanted them to use it more. And if people weren't using it, we wanted to get them into it. So we had different task forces created around initiatives to start promoting that. There was a focus on integration with existing communication channels and platforms, such as Slack, Sketch, and Abstract. If things are working well, tie them together. And this is just incredibly important in an engineering-centric culture, which is about bridging design and engineering pipelines. Again, another task force took this on about connecting out what the outputs come into Envision into the engineering pipeline. And now back to this slide. Again, just want to make sure it's crystal clear to everybody. Nobody here reported to me. Not one person on this slide. I try to live by this quote, I really do. Um, so this is how I affect the design at scale at Autodesk. And with relationship maps, you can do this too. And that's what I have to share with you tonight. And I'd love to open it up to questions. Hi. Hi. I was just wondering um, what was the array of tools that Envision replaced? And by focusing on one tool, did you save the company money? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll, in, in all um, candor, I am no longer with Autodesk. So shortly after this launch, uh, and just a, a couple months ago, I departed. So I don't know where they are with the, the money fact. But I'll come back. The, the big challenge in Autodesk's environment is that there were 150 product teams that had been assembled over years of time. Some of them even competed with one another until very recently. Um, the definition of design was a variable. Some designers used PowerPoint to create their wireframes. Some just drew them out on paper. Others were as advanced as using you know, Envision already, or some were using Sketch. So the breadth and depth of what was being used was all over the place because there was no attempt ever to unify anything. So what we're hoping to do is be additive and not take anything away. 
And that was a really important piece of this is, if we went out and said, we're giving you Envision, but we're gonna start pulling your other things away, I would have failed out of the gate. So down the road, there certainly would have been, in my vision, an effort to start clipping some of the tools that either do this or um, are just out of alignment with what we call modern you know, practices. Uh, so that's, that's the answer there. On the money side, I don't know. We did negotiate a really good two-year term well below what the market value was for that, but I can't speak to um, specifically the, the cost savings beyond that because we just hadn't gotten there yet. Does that help? Okay, great. What was the role of uh, your VP? Did this effort start with you or initiated by the VP? And if that's the case, if it started with you, what was the role of the VP? Because I see this effort coming from the VP rather than somebody who's working for the VP. Yeah, great question. So I was the chief of staff to the VP. Uh, she gave me free reign to run this program. I came to her with the idea uh, when I first started, I'll back up, there was no communication channel for me to even reach out to 400 designers. There wasn't even an email list. They weren't on, they didn't even have Slack. There was nothing. And for someone who felt like one of our goals was going to be communicating things out to a much larger company, that's a big sign for a problem because we didn't have that. So no matter what we started doing, if we didn't open up a pipeline and dialogue channel to the designers, that had no place to go. Immediately realizing that, that's when I pursued this, pro this challenge with her around the fact that we need to be more uh, thoughtful on tools and resources. And she really gave me free reign to run with this one. So yeah, certainly you know, self-identified in a way, but certainly, Tools and resources is a big part of what, uh, what design operations is all about, and that's something that I've been focused on. Does that help? <laughs> Nothing. I was wondering what VP did that. Yeah, yeah. Well, my VP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. But yeah, the, oh, I'll just quickly. The VP, my, my boss, Maria, was responsible for massive culture change and creating an entire community. Uh, and a vision around design, around connecting experiences, um, around quality of products. So we had, we had a very clear set of four key things in our mission statement that were all drafted up for her and leading with, with different um, people that reported to me or throughout the company. So this was one segment of the higher goals that she had. Yeah. Yes? Um, so I think you may have just answered my question, but uh, I was just curious about where where this started, because um, it's really leading into change management and you know and a huge company that's been around for a long time and with all these yep. different things in place, like I can just imagine how difficult that must be. Um, and I'm wondering just where the inspiration to start this project. Where, did you take it on? Did you initiate it, or was that something that Maria said? Okay, we want you to do this. Yeah, I helped to define the role of chief of staff with Maria as, as soon as I came on board. And tools and processes is something that we just agreed to. And I don't, I, it must have been when we sat down to draft the job description, you know, we needed a job description and, and there it was. But something around tools and resources was certainly in there. So again, as soon as I came on board, that was an area that I would need to start focusing on. You know, this really came out of, of research. We had, that, you know, I, I assembled the task force it started off with research. We went around the company asking people what tools they were using. Once we were able to get, once we were able to get Slack up and running and get, you know, two, three, four hundred, maybe two to three hundred designers, once we had volume in there and we had a channel to start talking to designers, then we were able to start putting feelers out there and we put a survey out for them to finish that talks about what tools they're using, what are important, and most of them, you know, would even, would even start, like I said, you, consider design tools that we, I would never consider to be a design tool. So, um, like I said, with when I saw PowerPoint and there's a design tool, you know, like when there were listed stuff and other, a lot of odd things came up that had me you know, a bit perplexed on what was going on. But that's okay, that, if that's how people work, that may be really fine for their team, but to create a cohesive family of products that is really starting to focus on mobile and web as the long term we need to, to move. So really it's around, you know, transitioning at some point um, from 
primarily desktop to getting into mobile and cloud and getting to modern toolkits to do that and starting to find the right people to get into that space. So really, if there's you know, harmonizing things and getting people together, but change management's a big part of this too. Like, yeah, you hit that on the head. Well, it, so it sounds like you, you helped create the system then to accomplish the, like what, they, what your, your mission was to get everyone on the same tools and this was your system. That this you was the beginning to, of the system, correct. I mean, this, is, this would really be a multi-year play given the size and the, 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 the uh, how do I say this, some of the venerability of some of the desktop products. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, triggered by this uh, question and discussion over here, I'm actually curious about the two uh, ends of your experience with this process. So you'd mentioned that initially there wasn't any way to get a, even a hold of all 400, or possibly you didn't even know that there were 400 designers out right. there. So. I'm curious about like how you f connected up with them, how you created the community to have this discussion, and then it sounds like Slack was a part of that. Um, and then on the other end, um, is the goal, is part of the choice of uh, Envision sort of the ability to take as input pretty much anything that people produce out of their tools, something between it could be flat PNGs, it could be JPEGs, it could be whatever, all the way to sketch files and whatever else people are using. Yeah, great. So on the beginning of this, finding these designers was a lot of work. It was a very manual process. And while we had some things in Workday that helped with it, it didn't do enough. So uh, meaning I couldn't just type in designer and actually find all the designers in the company. There was nothing that easy. And when I did, I would get some strange outputs because the word design was used in different ways or even inaccurately, or even some of the people's roles that they had. They were a designer, but they were listed as something else by title. So there was a lot of manual effort. We had created a team called the Design Council, which was uh, made up of senior leaders all around the company that acted as sort of the beacons for their groups. And I worked with them to help create all things, right, an Excel spreadsheet. It's 2017, and we're working in Excel spreadsheets to create a staffing inventory. It's maddening, but it was the, the best way to do it. And I, I started finding people. I handed the, the findings I had to them. They would update the rest of it. So it was a little bit of back and forth until we had a really nice set. Uh, and then that would start serving as the place of when we created something like Slack or the email list those would feed into the invites. And we knew how many people we had, and we could see if our channel's only 100, then we still have a few hundred more to go to get everybody involved. Um, so hopefully that answers a little bit about the beginning. But certainly Slack was a big part of it because um, I created a Slack channel for our team because we just needed something. About a week in, or maybe about two or three weeks into us having it set up and running, I find out that the company, this is my first or second month there, I find out that the company is actually rolling out a corporate, uh, an enterprise version of Slack. So we were one of the, actually the first groups of the entire company to be brought into the enterprise package and had it pre-populated with you know, a good bit of designers. So luckily, it's a good example where something that we did was actually being pursued by the company at large. And then on the end side of the question, uh, would you repeat that? Yes, uh, so you chose, you chose Envision, yeah. and um, I'm wondering if that's, if a factor of that is sort of the multiplicity of inputs that Envision can take. Uh, yeah, Because yeah. so many of, because they're, the tools in use were so varied, yeah. maybe someone's output is PowerPoint slide, maybe someone's output is a JPEG, maybe it's a PNG, maybe it's a full sketch file. Yeah, yeah. There was something really attractive about it. Like, you know, at the point where I made the decision to go with Envision, there was a lot of talk around Adobe XD. It wasn't ready. I, it just wasn't ready. Like, I had to make a call. I'm like, okay, Adobe, Adobe usually tends up taking over things. That's yeah, good. Good for them. That's what they do. But here was Adobe, and here is this little thing called, you know, this small company with Envision. At some point, am I make, I, had, I actually had a bit of self-doubt if I was making the right call when we were doing this you know, a little over a year ago. And, uh, because 
or maybe even a year and a half ago when we selected it because of the threat of something else coming along. And I had to swallow just the pill that says, something better is always coming, but we need to do something. Because if we don't, we're going to continually be in this state of wishing we had some way of communicating. And yes, I think the, the, when I talked with people at Envision, and, and I was actually on uh, a group, an advisory board, so I started to understand some of the stuff that was coming up as well, and some of the roadmap helped me understand that they were going to be a major player. And the, the ability, right, to have all sorts of different files, and the fact that it's, it's, it's web, you know, it's browser-based, was really, really nice as well. That way we're not dealing with people on, on platform-specific issues as well. Um, you know, kind of like some, we're struggling, we were struggling with Sketch with that for a little bit. And what was the, the newest thing Envision came out with? Their Sketch competitor, Studio, right? Like the minute that came out, that was kind of a big deal, which was, okay, now they're actually starting to recreate some of these things in the web space on top of their existing pipeline. So they're looking to create an ecosystem. And I, being aware of that and knowing all these inputs was a key, key influence around that choice. And how, how much time has this story uh, been? covered so far? Well, let's see. I started Autodesk in January of 2016. And like I said, within the first month or two is when I got Slack up and running and started to realizing the issues around the tools and resources. So it's going to be, you know, it was probably 20, a year from the, the, just this, the beginning of doing some research to the point of getting it launched. And then you saw what happened in six months with some of the results after that. But it's not easy. Like again, change management in a big company, you're asking a lot, and and some people just won't ever touch it. Some designers won't ever touch it. Like I've had people, designers look at me and say, I don't know how to use this, and it's not for me. It's not for the desktop products we're working on. And I had to start creating examples or use cases that are best for their type of product because they're not web or mobile. So you know there was some challenges of getting more people on board, but that was that's for someone else to do now. Hi. Hello. So my question was more about the, the research part, because you mentioned at the very beginning you did some broad research, and yeah. I mean, even mining for the names is, is another way. And then building the relationships where the information flows to you that way, how did you continuously keep information, you know, not that you had this vision and then you keep going forward, but that you kept getting information back? Yeah, yeah. Well, for me, um, like I said, the design council helped quite a bit because they were, they were the leads or senior members in the company that helped represent an area of the, of, and working with them really helped a lot because they were already in the company for much longer. I was, you know, I was there two, three, four months. Some of these people have been there 20, you know, 20 years. So working with them was critical. Plus, it's their design teams. At the end of the day, we're trying to make something of value to them, and we need to make sure that we're understanding what they're doing and not just putting something out there because it's, it's the new cool thing, but that it actually serves a need for them. So, um, and then the research actually worked with one of our researchers in the company, which is great. You know, someone that wanted to help, again, make change in the company. He didn't report to me, but he came on board. He created all the, the, the survey, collected all the results, did everything that you know, a great researcher did. So I think, but actively listening and working with the leaders around the company is a big deal. And that was our, our main interface as a practice group was to that la layer of leaders. Okay. You're welcome. Um, I have a quick question related to research. So yeah. I will ask that. So as a researcher, I'm curious to know uh, what were some of the most important questions you went into when, like what were the top questions you wanted answered? When you were doing the research, and were yeah. there different questions for different groups? Because I, I, I understand there were different groups of people. Yeah. This is just my curiosity, <laughs> you know, if it's possible, and uh, like a hypothesis that or a presumption that you went in with, and you all in the research process found out something different or something similar. Yeah, yeah. Very curious to know that. I don't have those details. This is going back a ways, okay. uh, you know. So it's going back, you know, a year and a half or so. I wish I did, or I wish I could pull the report up for you. Um, I trusted the researcher on our group to ask the questions. We, we reviewed them, but I, I really put a lot of faith into him. And I think it helped the relationship because he really stayed on the process for a long time. But really, you know, what, what I was trying to see was the array of things being used and the importance level of those different tools. 
Uh, and it, I think we even open, asked some open-ended questions of like what, you're, you know, what you use but you don't like to use. So we tried to get a little bit of qualitative as well as quantitative to make some decisions. But great question. Um, maybe I'll put that in another presentation, like just the, the, the research part of it. Yeah, I just think the breadth, the biggest issue, again, was the, the breadth of tools being used and that every group or person was paying for them individually as well. And none were, you know, some people in the same teams weren't even using the same tools, much less going from group to group. So, um, you know, you take 150 different products, you probably have 150 product teams. How many scrum teams do you have then? You know, hundreds of scrum teams and every design, some don't even have designers on those teams. So a lot of variables and a lot of just ways people are used to working. Um, and, and you know, looking at that data, being a bit surprised, but also not surprised. And then the hardest part, again, was just making the decision of what to make as the new additive thing that could either replace or complement these things without being threatening to people. Right. I, I'll just ask one last question. Yeah, sure. Because it's, uh, uh, because it's like related to what you're talking about, uh, how easy No, no, we didn't. I, I love it. You know, and again, here's like I didn't have a. I had a researcher. You know, he helped a little bit on. You know, he helped. He helped get some stuff done, and he helped stay on a, a different task force. He helped with another thing. I think our big challenge was simply that, uh, you know, while this worked and while it launched, there were a lot of things that were done in a way that didn't cover all the bases or get into the level of detail I had hoped, but it got done. Um, so yeah, if I had if I had a full time researcher on our team, even a half time, even a quarter time, I'm sure it would have been handled much differently. But working on you know two hours a week with a researcher, it's a very different thing of just taking the time when we can get it. This is a relevant problem, I think, for many companies. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of research. I would say hire more researchers. Like really, like there's so. I mean, if if designers are outnumbered by engineers, like think of how poor off we are in terms of user researchers and companies. So the numbers are bad. I'm, to me, I'm just, I'm not happy with them. So hopefully we can get them up higher. Yes? Two part question. Um, the first one is, was training across the board yeah. in the picture? And if, if it was, at what capacity you engage training for the designers, engineers, and, and you know, even just to work with designers, how to work with designers as an example. Yep. It's part of change management. The second part of the question is, um, organizationally, what makes a design team, I think, powerful is the diversity in skill sets, which sort of map itself to different tools. So when you bring the tools to a narrow set of tools, you inherently or implicitly um, squeeze the skill sets. So somebody who can actually be really good um, with drawing and do a storyboard quickly sort of goes out the window because they have to use tools now that are dedicated for the company. So what was yep. your take on that? Yeah, so I'll take the first one. So training was certainly something considered and something we worked closely with the Envision team on. We had a dedicated customer success manager who was able to create some programs for us. Uh, when, we, when we launched, she included some things um, in a welcome kit they had a lot of self-serve things because we didn't have a dedicated training team. But we were able to turn um, a lot of existing assets that were created for training designers over to them when we welcomed them. So I think as soon as they signed up for the first time and registered, they got a welcome email. And then we also published training links inside of the interface of Envision from time to time when relevant things came up. Um, we also focused on things internally. Um, those topics that I talked about at the end about increasing adoption were all really focused on task forces that I started that were around um, training and getting teams focused on how to use Envision for web and mobile, training and getting people to understand how to use it for their desktop, and then the last one was around creating unified pipelines between Envision and the technology, the, the engineers. Now, 
those three efforts are distinct but somewhat overlapping. And the goal is to start working with these teams to create use case examples so that people could actually understand them and then we could get some motivation behind it and tie it into different training methods as well. So we really wanted to promote it from within the company. I think that's more important than from outside, especially when you're working in, in a company that well, is this big and has very specific asks. It's not, it's, we're not just focused on web and mobile. It's, it has a whole much more complicated and much more dated layer to it. So yes, training was there. That's where I was headed next. But like I said, uh, something I don't have a lot more visibility into where it is today. Um, the second part, yes, I agree. Like I, you know, I am not someone who is a big fan of taking away tools from people or telling them what they need to use. But there is something about aligning a designer's efforts with the big high vision of the company. And if we can provide a tool that helps with that, like what Envision can do, and really bring it closer to a cohesive family of products, I'm willing to, to have a few designers be pissed at me about it mm -hmm. in the process. Um, but I'm not taking anything away. If they wanted to do their sketches and scan it in or take a photo of it and upload it into Envision in the spaces, great, if that's how they want to work. But you know, sooner or later, at some point, these ways of working in modern prototyping environments are going to be the standard. And it's important that they at least have the knowledge to get there. It's almost like, all right, if you know how to do it, then you can kind of dismiss it and go do you know, something really abstract. But I think it's important to know how to do it and then consider how to play that in part of your portfolio as a designer tool. Okay. Hi. You talked about standardizing around one tool um, in Vision. Yeah. I was just curious if someone was trying to improve dev design ops across the company, are there other categories of tools and processes that they should also be looking into to standardize? Yeah. And what are they? I hinted a little bit around you know um, abstract and sketch. Uh, I think. We, on the one task force that I was working on with the web and mobile, we were really focusing on the entire pipeline of what an ideal web and mobile tool set pipeline would be for Autodesk. And um, that, that certainly was the, the sort of sketch to, I think it was sketch to abstract to envision. Does that make sense? Is that the, yeah, that would be the order. Again, I'm going back just a little bit. And then on the outside, it was inspector out to JIRA. So we had sort of mapped an ideal pipeline. This is kind of like the North Star of where we could be someday. That was, uh, you know, we met with the folks from Sketch. We met with the folks from um, Abstract. They came out, you know, despite that, that wonky launch they had, um, you know, still a really valid tool. So we did have a vision for it. And this was based a lot on the input from the designers. You know, I sat down with, um, the designers and the task forces who were some really you know, dedicated to helping make the change and who in the web and mobile task force were at a space where they understood this usage of the modern tools the best. So that was our snapshot from you know, the, the entire pipeline. You know, the time it would take to get there though would be even a question if that's still the toolkit in a year or two out because of the need just to, just to put wheels on the bike first. Like we had much bigger issues to address, but it was certainly an important one to have a, a North Star picture for. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, great, you're welcome. Well, I, I, let me ask a question. I'll, I'll take the prerogative of holding the microphone. Hi. So uh, you started there to talk about other aspects of design ops. So what, other, what were the other things in Autodesk that people were addressing while you were addressing this? Yeah, you know, I, I, I've spoke about design ops a little and I write about it a little. I think that um, there is a sense of, of uh, culture, which is really important. I think community and culture is a really important part of design operations. I think, um, like I said, that the commonality and tools and, and resources and helping people get trained around it. Um, the, you know, I, I really appreciate the human side of design operations more myself, you know, and I appreciate the technical side and it needs to happen, but there was a lot around that, that, that human aspect of it. You know, I think I worked on a quality task force that was focused on 
um, people quality. And it was about helping define job descriptions and career paths because they weren't. Like, people had titles for reasons that I still couldn't understand. Uh, and the career paths were unknown. They didn't know where they were going. And, and you know, some designers were writers before they became UX people. Like, the, there was a, there was a an, it was as if That's they were- That's why they use PowerPoint. Right, there you are. But they're doing jobs, not a career. And it's important to help them have something much more important to go for. Like, it's important for all of us to have careers. So that was a really important part of it as well. So those are like really three main areas of focus. Um, and then really promoting design as a business. Like designers are really, really important for a business. And it's, it's like we, we, and promoting design leadership. Like I think the more of us in this room that can start becoming leaders, that can really understand the business of design, the more big, big impact we're going to have. And I think this is the best time to do it. So you know, get a little more business savvy and like break out of some of the comfort zone and you know, take some chances there because that's where the real, I think the real next frontier of design is. It's not in these tools and apps, but it's like getting out into the company and making them there. I'll ask you one question. No more research question. <laughs> no research okay. question. No, I'm teasing. Um, you Surrounded by researchers, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. <It's> okay. <laughs> you have a very interesting quote out there, which we, I guess, all of us hear about designers and researchers that you know, these, these are Mac users and, you know, they, I think you had a very interesting, any uh, interesting takeaway during your relationship building about related to that? Like, could you talk, talk a little bit more about that? Which I part exactly? Just so uh, I can, if you go back. Is it, oh, one of the slides. Sure, yeah. I can go back. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, uh, yeah, yeah, and some, a few others. Oh, I on the quotes. Lot, like, let me just uh, go, oh, let me just hold this button down. <laughs> <laughs> I have it here in my do, 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 do. Was there any, yeah. Okay, so these. Yeah, was like through your relationship map, does, does you know. Well, this stuff's know. real. I mean, it's almost like, you know, we, you know, uh, was it like our personas, right, as designers, right? <laughs> right? Um, you know, this is, you know, this is the kind of the curmudgeon designer, and this is kind of the, like the really IT person. This is like the like, what do you guys do? I don't know how to even hire you people. So, um, but, and I think this is, I think the, the big nugget here is, is intention and purpose. And I think if we can start being really purposeful in aligning design and our design team values with the highest goals and purposes of the company, we can start and, and really be able to articulate and speak to that. It gets away from some of this stuff. Like design in a lot of these cases is seen as an artifact. And I think if we can start changing that narrative and showing that we're, you know, design's a verb, design is a, is a team, it's about the big D, not just creating things to pass along. Um, and really holding the company accountable for understanding that, um, then we can start, again, making this change possible. And I think it's the ripe time to do it. There's enough articles, there's enough people. But I would say, uh, my big takeaway is, like, the, the sort of, um, again, yeah, the, just the typical, the, like, the typical personas, like, what we think of IT people, or what, you know, like, like HR, I mean, think of, if, I bet if we had a board and we just wrote, like, tell me the top things you think of HR, Probably the same. And you know, John Maeda said, "What well, HR is highly regarded." I, I dig that. I love working with IT. I, I mean, uh, HR. I think they're an incredibly important group, um, but not everybody does. But I think it's just understanding, you know, understanding their needs, understanding what's going on outside of the world of design, and taking ownership for that and setting an example for them is going to be the way to do it. Because if we just sit here and say, "I want people to treat me as a designer differently," they're not going to do it. I think you have to, again, back to that, you can make the change you want to be. If you want to be this, this, and this, you'll need to go do it yourself. And I think it's a really great thing to pursue. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I'll try one question here. Uh, you mentioned about business value and then communicating your insights in different ways for your boss's boss. I can't remember his name. Can you maybe give some examples of I guess changes that you did that you didn't anticipate in terms of how to communicate that value and in, in, in ways for the most you know, senior executives. This is, and this goes back to the question of what you know, what did my boss do, right? The VP thing. She worked very closely with Amar to really help understand what was going on in the world of the product space, and really 
mine, you know, she spent maybe three or four months before I even came on board with Autodesk as a, as a global tour to understand what was going on from people and taking things to him and getting these big high level things framed for us. Um, you know, it, it's tricky because with change management, not everybody wants to change. You know, even if Amar wanted to change, it doesn't mean everybody else wanted to change either. So these are, you know, this is where it gets into a little bit of a tough situation, which is just change management. And, you know, things like, you know, what another thing I was responsible for was uh, communications. Like, uh, back to, I think it was Nancy was asking, you know, I, I was responsible for our communications out to the rest of the company and finding ways of sharing success stories in design with everybody. So we, and, and we just started sending emails out to the entire company every month. You know, we had a newsletter that went out email every month. And email's a little dated, but it, was, it worked in, in Autodesk. It, it was a culture where people still used a lot of email. And you know, the ability to tell success stories and show, and, and again, own the narrative of design instead of letting other people do it was really important for us. And, um, and that certainly came from some of the values of, of that Amar set and aligning ourselves with those. You know, if Amar says he wants us to work on um, collaboration uh, or you know, uh, uh, I would say, I'm trying to remember some of these. These are going back away because, you know, I, I generally ignore posters on the wall <laughs> in the office. But um, team, you know, it was like something over teams and silos. You know, he had some amount, and we would try to make sure that the things that we had would point directly to this. Like, this story supports this thing that Amara is trying to do. This story supports this thing that, that the CEO is trying to do. So it's like, you know, finding ways of telling that story that shows how design supports that and then getting those messages out there. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Thank okay, you. okay, great. A lot of the discussion here has been about tools and whatnot, but I was most intrigued by your comment of each of those key stakeholders from those different groups, you had an emotional connection with them. What, how do you find that? What's, that's, that's a little bit of magic there. I'd like yeah, to it understand. is. There's a little art and science. You know, there's an art of leadership and a science of leadership. And there, you know, uh, I think that you know, leading with empathy is going to be a really important start. And, and like I said, like really wanting to understand what's going on with other people. And when you're talking with them, like really listening to what they're saying, hearing their stories, or if they're asking for help in something, really trying to, to tease out where they are. And like I said, that's a, that was a really important thing for me. I consider myself a relationship-based leader, like talking to people, trying to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it, so that I can help either um, align those things, even if it's outside of work. Like I'll find some commonality. You know, I, that dot connector. Like I'll find some commonality between this person I'm talking with and somebody over here that I used to know and find some way of matching those things up. So um, when people ask me my superpower, I usually say it's about connecting dots. And I, I look at working with people in that same manner. I guess I'm just always looking for some angle to connect people I know through some way. But it, is, it does take time. Like you know, building relationships with people and getting them to tr you know, trust you is gonna take a little bit of time. And not everybody likes to hear that because you know, we want stuff now, now, now. But the reality is you know, it, that's part of the process for me. I, I just want to make an observation. A lot of what you're saying reminds me of what I've heard about strategic selling, where you need to understand what the person's goals are personally in order to motivate them to buy what you're selling. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that's true. And I, I mentioned a little bit about the intrinsic motivators. Like, you know, just, it's almost like getting, you know, I, almost becoming friends with colleagues and, and dropping some judgment and, and letting these personas go and understanding like they're trying. When I really understand why they're using some of the tools they're using and they have no choice because of the legal ramifications if they don't, what do I like? It's nothing I can say. It's like, yeah, they have to use this awful tool <laughs> and we have to use it too because of these reasons. Um, doesn't doesn't make it easy. It doesn't make me want to throw my laptop when this this site you know, I, you know it takes a half an hour to just to enter my name, but I still have to use it. And at least I have a little bit more understanding. Thanks for the observation. I 
think that we will close the formal part of the meeting and let everybody rush up and greet you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I really thank you, Michael. It. Thank you. Thank you.